Hi, how are you? I'm Mario Gray. Thank you for having me. Fun. Don't worry about the title of this talk. I'm just showing you a slide for informational purposes. Um, anyway, I'm at VMware, and I work at VMware as a developer advocate. Uh, so it's not necessarily tied to Kotlin, but it's tied morely to the Spring framework. Um, but what I'm going to do today is actually just talk about Kotlin and like how I'm using it and how I think developers will get an actual better benefit of developing uh, software uh, in, in a pragmatic and a, in a fun way as well uh, using Spring Boot and Kotlin. Um, and some of the things that Kotlin adds to the environment while developing an application. Um, because if you're using Java, okay, first of all, if you're using another language that's not Java, I'm pretty sure you're not using Spring Boot. You're definitely not using Spring Boot if you're using Clojure. You, you wouldn't do it. Uh, Clojure is purely functional, and you don't have the necessary um, capability to do the things that Spring does, like create, you know, um, objects that are uh, singletons. You, you don't need to, you already have singletons in, in these functional languages. Um, and so there's really only a need for modularization uh, rather than an IOC. So um, because I have been working on an IOC container for my whole life, um, well, at least most of my developer life now, um, I want to show you what uh, it's like when you're using a slightly functional language, the JVM, and Spring. Uh, so we're using Kotlin to do this. And to start, I made a little picture. And this picture is just kind of demonstrating, oops, nobody's using that anymore. That's old software. Don't, don't worry about that. Um, OK, yeah, back here. Um, eventually, we'll, eventually, we'll have to use Windows for Workgroups uh, 3.11 again. But until that day, I'm leaving it down there. Uh, so this is, this is a uh, software that I've been writing for a while. And it is based on, right, Kotlin. This is a, uh, the programming language that I'm using primarily. Um, it's the, using the Spring Framework and microservices. Of course, who doesn't like microservices? That The word alone inspires people, uh, inspires you to write lots of software. And I, I think largely the word microservice um, and Spring kind of go together. Um, but, you know, microservices can be anything. But you never, say, you never hear anybody say something like microservices and COBOL. That just doesn't sound right, right? So we're going to do the, you know, microservices with Kotlin and Spring. Um, particularly, uh, how do you index data? How do you persist data? And how do you basically cache data? And how do you create counters and things like that uh, in a, a non-imperative way? Now, we have a stack. And that stack is a core services. And I'll show you to this. I'll show you what it looks like in code. So let's go here. Um, these core services allow us to basically say, hey, I want to save some data. Think about a repository. And think about the data persistence layer that you want to save it to, right? And we have our indexing. Hey, I want to be able to store data. And I want to be able to query its properties. And I want to be able to uh, make you know, complex search queries against that um, in a way that is understandable. So this is an advanced architecture that I'm using. I'm not using CQRS. Uh, I'm using standard object-oriented and functional um, programming uh, capabilities here. And then messaging. So we, we need to be able to, uh, in the application, send messages across um, instances or, or people. Uh, think about how email works. Uh, email is the basic idea of messaging. You have an inbox, right? And you have an email that you want to SMTP message that you want to send. And you receive it in your inbox, and you can do whatever you want with it. Uh, and until you read it, you know, until you delete it, it's going to be there. Um, and a chat application works very similar to how uh, email works, except every message is ephemeral. That means it'll disappear in a few seconds, or it'll be saved, and you won't see it again. So that's what we're doing here. We're, we're creating a chat system that says, hey, I'm going to be receiving messages, and I want to be able to visit them, and then I, I don't care about the rest. Uh, but maybe one day I can search for them, too. Uh, so that, that's an operation type of um, activity. All right. Um, going on is going to be something like 
hey, I have this data store, it's called Cassandra, and I want to be able to talk to it. Uh, I want to be able to persist everything there, but I also want to be able to search for everything. I don't want to create indexes within Cassandra. Uh, that could get very complicated. Uh, so I, I believe that it's good to separate uh, at the application layer the searching capabilities. So we're going to use Elasticsearch, and we're going to develop the actual uh, searching capabilities in the app uh, on that layer. And then Redis, uh, if you probably noticed, I like Redis. Um, Redis has capabilities for you know, um, key value. Uh, it has object stores. It has um, pub sub. Pub sub is very important when you want to fan out uh, events or messages. Uh, its particular version of pub sub is not like Kafka, where Kafka is a log store and it's persisting every message. Um, Redis's pub sub doesn't do that. It will take the message, it will fan out that message, and then that's it, it's gone. So the purpose of that is to abstract pub sub with Kotlin and Spring. All right. Now, that might have been a load of stuff, but let's check that out and see what it means in Kotlin and how Kotlin allows us to essentially get into the Spring framework, write objects, save them, and, and do a number of, of fun um, things. Now, first of all, who here uses Kotlin on purpose? On purpose. Like, you might, you might have an open source project or you get paid for it, one of those two things. Uh, generally, it's, it's on purpose if you like it. Um, who, uses, who codes in COBOL on purpose? Just to ask. Okay, okay, at least there's more people who use Kotlin than COBOL. Okay. Absolutely. So what we want to do is you guys need to be able to see things, right? And I want to be able to um, appearance and uh, theme. Let's go to macOS Lite. And uh, there we are. Let's, let's make this a little bigger. Is that, is that good? Well, we can make it 36 or 48. Um, I'm not going to show you like the complicated stuff uh, that like, you know, oh, Lord. Okay. You can see that from space, right? You don't need a telescope anymore. Um, yeah, now, now I can't see anything, so or me and you, we're gonna, we're gonna fight about this. Okay, uh, I want size 26, you guys want 48. I can't see with 48, you can't see with 36. Well, somewhere in the middle we'll meet. All right, so we have, I'm going to start at my core services. Uh, so in, essentially, um, like the simplest thing that you can do is test data, right? So the first thing you want to do is, you know how I did the TDD talk earlier? Um, I took that to heart and I said, hey, why don't we just write a whole entire project and do it the TDD way? So I didn't write any production code. I just wrote tests, lots and lots of tests. And, and that's what we have here. We have lots and lots of tests. First of all, Kotlin is cool. Kotlin is inspiring. Kotlin makes me go, I want to code some more. I don't have to think about uh, exactly what's going to happen tomorrow, because I can always wake up and just start Kotlin doing the following thing. If I, if I want to test code and say I don't want to start up my IDE, I can just do this. I have a REPL. REPLs are amazing. Um, if you've used a REPL, and you probably have if you're not pro programming in Java, um, there's a Java REPL out there somewhere, but um, for Kotlin, it's baked into the language. So you get to test your code patterns immediately. So you probably noticed a few things here that are slightly different from your typical Java code. Hi. Oh, you don't need a vowel. Excuse me. Um, you probably noticed a few things that are a little bit different here from your typical method. Um, first of all, this is a top-level method. So Kotlin supports top-level methods. You don't have to have a class, which means you can just have a, a Kotlin file, and you can just type the actual data. You can type the function at the top level, and you can call it that way, too. So this will compile, right? The same thing here will compile um, that I did in the REPL. Now, 
it's not advised to do top-level code. It's the same thing in JavaScript. You wouldn't want to write top-level global variables. You, you would rather you know, put them inside of a scope. So that's why I use classes. I, I tend to bind my, my variables and my methods to, to a class. All right. So remember, Kotlin's still running on the JVM. It still abides by the JVM rules, which means that you have a, a, a type system. That type system is a little loose. It's a little looser than it was uh, when you're using your, your typical uh, you know, uh, Java 11 or... Who's using Java 11 here or Java 8? Who's using Java 9? Okay, so yeah, it's, it's spreading up. It's trending upwards to, towards 11 and out. Um, who's using anything more than Java 11? Kotlin supports that JVM. So that means that you can still write the same code and get the benefits of that version of the JVM that you're using, uh, which is great. OK, so if you've noticed, there are backticks on this code. Why are there backticks? Why would anybody want to write a method that you have to use spaces, and you have to precede it, and you have to wrap it with backticks? Well, when you're writing a test, for instance, uh, think about when you get a, uh, an error in that test. You want to know exactly in a description what failed, right? You want to see, hey, um, this thing failed, and you don't want to have to read a compound sentence with up, you know, camel case. Uh, and usually camel case just makes your eyes dither and, and kind of you know, turn into a little, you turn into a zombie. Or if you're, use, if you're used to using camel case, this happens to you. Let's get out of here. Let's move that over to a non-window. But yeah, if you're using camel case, this happens to you. And you have to read your methods to the side. And what happens is you, you think about this picture, and you stop wanting to code so much, because it's like now all your words have to run against each other. And Rick Astley comes out, and he talks to you, and he sings you a song. And you know the world can't handle that. I, I can't handle it, and, and neither can uh, Twitter either. So you've effectively been Rickrolled when you use camel case in your test methods. And the way Kotlin solves it is uh, this way. So I can say, can use back text to make human readable code. And I like that. I like human readable code. I would never call this function. Um, if you've ever seen somebody do this, please send them that picture. Tell them, hey, like, cool off, right? Like, back off, man. <laughs> um, OK. So that's a cool feature of Kotlin. Uh, you know, of course, you have the generics. I'm not going to go into generics. If you're already using JVM, you know what generics are. Kotlin abides by the same rules of generics that, that any JVM language does. Uh, so we don't have to get into that. Um, some cool things that I've come across are this. So since I don't use data types uh, on purpose, I tend to use generics. But when I do have data, um, I don't use classes. I use data classes. Uh, if you're using uh, Java, you know how to write a POJO, or you know how to write a um, Java bean. And most of the time, you don't want a Java bean. You want a POJO. Uh, you, you just want, like uh, I guess, a, a few properties. And you don't want to have to annotate it with serialized. right? So that's why we have. Um, Let's see here. Here is a. Oh, also, actually, these are these are kind of um, Java beans in a way since they are uh, interfaced. So I, I should probably back that statement up by saying, well, you can go in the middle here, um, and at some point I'll have a actual implementation of this data classes. Okay, so. What's a data class? And if you've used a case class in Scala, if you've used, has anybody used Scala by any chance on purpose? Oh, OK, good. Um, so we have case classes in Scala. Um, you have data classes in Kotlin. You have records. And I think JV in Java 19, you have records. Uh, and it sort of addresses the same situation. Uh, in Kotlin, you've had this for a couple of year, for years. right? So all of these Android programmers are using a feature of the language that automatically makes their life easier. Um, you have the ability to just create a constructor 
uh, or just arguments, and you have a constructor right there. So what this is here is a data class called uh, a user. It's a chat user, and it's generified, of course, because I have a key, and that key is of type T, right? Um, and yes, I am using Cassandra for this, so I annotated each one of the parameters. But don't worry about that. Just understand that these are basic classes, POJOs, and that I don't have to write a body. So data classes on their own just look like this. And that's it. So then I can just say something like test user Mario, right? And well, of course, that's not going to work automatically. But you understand here um, how that's going to get used. Why is that right now? Now, the reason, OK, I'm not going to worry about that. Yeah, we don't worry about things right now. Um, compilation errors are fine. Um, another thing is when you're using data classes, and you've probably, you've probably seen that I have lots of interfaces. Can I see what, what you guys think about interfaces and, 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 uh, and POJOs? Do you like the idea of creating a POJO based off of an interface? Is that an anti-pattern or is that a pattern to you? Um, that's my question. I, I let you talk amongst yourselves. Um, I'm getting verklempt here. But um, overriding classes in Kotlin is simple. You don't use the you know, extends like you do in Java. You can't use the extends keyword here. Uh, instead, or implements for interfaces. So you don't have to worry about that with Kotlin. Uh, instead, you can just use, hey, data class X uh, have some properties, and here, are, here is the class that I am now overriding. So I'm, I'm subclassing this class called key, which is a heavily annotated um, interface that does many things above and beyond uh, the actual work of, uh, of containing data. Um, now, you're probably going, what is this? What is this companion object thing? Why do I need this? This companion object is really something that simplifies how do you, contain, how do you control state creation of an object that exists within an interface? How do you say, hey, I have an interface, but I want to be able to instantiate it and I want to be able to say this interface abides by the following constructor. Having a constructor in an interface is impossible. You can't put a constructor in an interface. But the closest you can get is to use a companion object. And so what I've done was create a factory. And that factory will say, hey, I'm going to create an instance, an actual object based off of this interface. So to all intents and purposes, to the JVM, you're looking at an instance of key. It, that's an object instance of key. But uh, to me, I'm just writing some code, and I'm saying, here's how it's going to look, and here is the actual um, you know, the way of, of using it. Let's find some usages for that. I've used it all over the place. So having an interface with a companion object means that I can do very generic operations, like creating instances of something that might get turned into something else or might be its own subclass. However, it will have the same uh, behavior uh, that I stipulate, that I, I want to tell it, this is the behavior of the object at start. And so key.funkey, because it's, I like it's fun, I feel like it's, it's Kotlin. I was having fun when I was writing this. And I said, hey, there needs to be like a really cool name for it. Anyway, um, should be able to just instantiate itself. And that's, uh, that's how that works. Now, is anybody like completely going, wait a minute, why are you doing this? This, this might look suspect to a lot, and, and it did look suspect to me. In fact, this whole entire code base might be a little suspect because I'm using so many uh, idioms that are not quite you know, the JVM way, especially this. What in the world is going on? Why do you have question marks and bangs in your code, Mario? Well, what we want to do is we want to say in Kotlin, you have the idea of immutability. And so that means that things cannot uh, not exist. You can't have nulls, basically. You have to have a, an actual value. And so in order to say, hey, this thing might not be null, might actually be null, you just use question mark. And it says, OK, look, if this thing is, the, the first thing it works like, if it's a parameter, it can be null. However, if you're accessing that instance, 
and you don't know if that instance is actually there, what normally happens is you get a null pointer exception error and you have to go back to test and make sure that you're able to isolate when you're going to get null. In Kotlin's case, you can say, hey, I'm pretty sure it's going to be null at some point. Uh, I can't be completely sure. So I'm going to allow it to be null by calling it this way. You can say, hey, question mark dot codec and bang, bang, which means it has to have a value. There must be a realized value from this call. So and essentially what I'm saying here is um, my JSON parser might not exist. If it doesn't, go ahead and, and throw. Um, but if it does exist, go ahead and then call codec uh, or get the parameter codec. Codec must be an object value. And if it's not, go ahead, throw an error. Give me a null pointer, um, a runtime. Let's see what happens if I do that in the REPL. Like, what is actually does that look like? Well, okay, so first thing I saw was uh, when I called foo with unit, unit is Kotlin's way of saying I don't have a value, the absence of value. It's like null. It's like um, not null, but it's void uh, for Kotlin. We'll get into units in a minute, but uh, what I said was, hey, pass it, but don't put anything in there. Second of all, the compiler caught me and said, hey, you can't just call this object um, and not have a value in it. So let's try something else. How about we just do that? Um, oh, var, my bad. <sighs> hmm. hmm, okay. So a few things that I just tried right now. Um, what I wanted to do was test the compiler and say, hey, can, you, can I declare a value and can I declare a value that's going to be null? And no, I can't. So Kotlin doesn't allow you to declare values that are not present at the moment that you declare them. Uh, normally, you can do that. You can say, hey, um, you know, uh, string foo equals null. And it, it can then change. It can mutate it later on. Because of immutability, that doesn't happen with, with vowels. Um, and I should probably talk to you guys about vowels and vars. What's the difference? Um, if you've used the new version of JVM, you already have var. Um, so just imagine if val was a version of var that says it always must exist. It's always an immutable object, and that's it. You can never uh, change or mutate uh, that, that pointer, that value itself. So the difference between val and var is the ability to, to either have a value or not have a value and then change that value. And that's it. It's real simple. It's pretty simple. Maybe not simple enough, because I would like to just say val test colon string and then say, okay, now test equals something, right? Uh, but I tend to not do that. I, hmm. So it's a, it's a thing about programming with, um, with immutability that makes things easier to read. You want to be as mutable as possible. You don't want to allow the developer down, you know, downstream to change state at some point in time, because then you get side effects when you have immutability, you're always guaranteed the same execution, or at least you're more guaranteed the same execution. You're, you're not going you know, to encounter a, a time in which you assigned a variable and it wasn't there. Um, with immutability, you don't have that problem because you're always dealing with values. Okay, so let's move on from val and var. Uh, let's go into something about Kotlin that I like and something that you probably might relate to in, in the JVM, like the switch statement, or if, you're, if you've done Scala or if you've looked at Scala code for no apparent reason, I have no idea why you would do that. Don't do that, you naughty people. Um, you guys, use, use when. So when is basically a comprehension of, of, um, of conditionals. And what you want to do is you want to collapse the block to one value. And what we're doing here is we're saying, um, when you have something like 
return when key, you're basically saying, okay, switch, and then give me that value. However, with unlike switch, you can't you can't put a a little bit of uh, you know state inspection in there. I want to be able to inspect its state, and I want to be able to do somewhat complex things, like I want to know if it's a type. And so when I say when key is a message, key can be anything. It might not be something that I think it is, but it could be a message key, which is a descendant of key, and so that's perfectly legal, right? Um, so the perfectly legal way of doing this is saying, okay, well, I'm probably testing this, and I'm saying, well, I want to know if it's a message key, or maybe later on down the line, I want to know if it's uh, a, another type of key. There might be subclasses that I don't know about. And then I can ask the compiler, hey, um, is this key a message? If it is, route it to some other piece of code. Um, and, and we do the exact same thing here. We just create a value, uh, an object that exists, uh, which is really cool. Um, I like the idea that I get the flexibility. Uh, and the flexibility is the thing that actually brought me towards Kotlin uh, because it, it didn't feel like I was in a straitjacket as much. Now, I have been coding Java a lot um, recently just because um, it's changing. It's getting evolved. It's becoming Kotlin-like. Uh, it's becoming functional-like. Uh, it's it kind of is achieving the goals that I've kind of wanted ever since I've started coding other non-JVM languages in the JVM. Or I'm sorry, non-object-oriented languages in the JVM. That would be weird <laughs> if you can just code something else and still have it compile. What is Rust anyway? I don't know. Um, okay. So let's move on. So what we're talking about data, we we're talking about data classes, and uh, we we're talking about object mutability. Uh, we were talking about uh, some of the cool, you know, switch cases, uh, conditional cases. Uh, let's do something completely off the wall here and not compile code, because the moment we compile code, the machine will turn off and Slack will start, and we don't want Slack to start up. Uh, let's go into a, a module and... Um, Let's go into a page. I'm going to show you guys something that might scare you. It's, it's reactive. I hope you don't feel bad about me saying, hey, reactive is cool. No, don't, don't worry about that. that. That's not the thing I wanted to show you. So um, I went ahead and, and said, OK, well, let's have the reactive talk. Let's, let's talk about Kotlin and how it gives us reactive development practices, right? Um, so first things first, uh, reactive extensions, they exist in almost every language now. C Sharp got it first. Uh, people at Netflix were mad about this. They said, that's impossible. How could dot, dot, dot .NET get this and us who use the awesome vaunted JVM not have this reactive framework? We had to use futures, and futures were largely blocking for a very long time. Uh, unless you use Twitter features, which were composable and operated like, you know, options and streams and things like that. They had collective collection type of um, operators against them. In any case, what happened was a few years ago, Netflix decided to port Rx Java or Rx streams, um, the reactive framework over to Java. And it was a wholly different uh, concept. It was a totally different uh, namespace. Uh, from there, we have the org reactive streams uh, guys who said, okay, let's, let's get this ball rolling and let's make an actual codified uh, reactive framework for Java. And now we have the reactive uh, streams framework uh, that I'll show you in a second. But what Kotlin does is it integrates with any reactive framework. There are multiple reactive frameworks, and one of them is Netflix, the other one is org reactive streams. Uh, and I believe they may even share code. Um, but don't quote me on the code part if they share code, uh, but it would make sense. In any case, what we want was an observable stream of data. I want to be able to know when data is coming in, and I want to be able to say, okay, um, I want to take this data and I want to mutate it, and then I want to pass it down to the next, to the next function, right? And so we get the ability to, to reason with our data uh, in a fluent and functional way, given reactive stream, just because of reactive streams. Um, not, not through reactive streams, though. Reactive streams really just specify how data is passed through the wire and how data goes between um, endpoints. Um, however, and also 
um, how data will also work against threads. So we're going to be talking about concurrent concurrency and what does reactive have to do with concurrency. In other words, can my data that I'm operating on using map, for instance, can that data then exist on another thread? And the answer is yes, it can exist on another thread. Um, so really quickly here, let's look at a very, uh, I would call it Byzantine, because this is older code, obviously. Um, reactive code, which is uh, essentially wrote, it's spelled out. It's essentially, I'm not integrating it with Kotlin itself. I am just coding through the reactive framework. Uh, and what does that even look like? Let's check it out. So I have lots of open functions. Uh, let's look at something that uh, is essentially, uh, it, it's probably this guy here, isn't it? Yeah. OK, so we have a summarizer. We basically wanted an aggregator, right? Uh, and in Kotlin, you can write you know, functions as first class, ob as first class parameters. It basically, uh, functions are first class uh, citizens within the you know, namespace um, of Kotlin. And what we wanted to do is take a stream, and we want to operate on that stream. Um, and so in Reactive, you have this idea that, okay, um, I have data coming out of a stream and I want to be able to do things like add or I want to be able to, you know, create a summary of what is inside of that stream. And at any point in time, I can emit a uh, summary of the stream. And that's what we do here. So if you noticed, we have something like this flux, uh, which is just a, a, an object that represents an infinite amount or zero data. Um, we have that. That's represented in that class. It's an argument. It just takes a bunch of elements, and it says, hey, uh, filter. So you have all of these really cool operators in your, fun in your reactive classes. You have, um, you have many, you know, you, I'm sorry, don't look at the many, but look at map, flat map. Flat map is basically taking two dimensions of data and collapsing it to one dimension, um, which means that you have columns of data, and you're just you're, you're essentially taking it down from a two-dimensional array to a one-dimensional array. Um, or in, in any case, you're just removing the array itself uh, in a zero dimension. Now, what's cool is that there are so many operators. So you have filter, you have group by, you flat map, and the list goes on. You don't have to write loops. Your for loops are, are gone. Um, People are generally going to look at the code and kind of grep what's going on through the natural language of, you know, filtering group by, you know what's happening. So it's kind of easy. I would like to say it's easier to reason with the code. I want to be able to reason with the code by just looking at it and not have to look at documentation as to why the loop variable has to change by two or three or whatever uh, the increment is. Uh, in any case, I want to be able to visit every element. So visiting elements in a uh, functional way is something that's very important. If you notice, the, the notation that I'm using is the lambda notation. I'm saying I have a function. It takes an argument, and it emits data, right? So in this case, uh, in Java, you would probably do something like, don't mind this. Let me just go ahead and write some pseudocode. The Java way would be something like new function, and that function would have to be uh, you know, typed, and it would have to take an argument, and it would have to uh, return something. It would have to return a, um, uh, let's see, let's just say return to string, I guess. Um, in Kotlin, you can go ahead and issue the whole, like, object-oriented function. You don't have to write function bodies. You can just say, okay, I'm going to reason by, with, a, um, with a lambda, with a closure. Uh, these closures are very easy to read for the developer. If you're used to using something like, you know, I don't want to say this out loud, JavaScript. If you if you've used it before, you would you would see the 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 power of being able to write closures and and make sense of what's got happening inside of that closure without you know much fuss. Uh, so PRs can can be better. It can make PRs better. It doesn't have to. Um, in fact, there, there's a nightmare of a PR in there somewhere, I'm pretty sure. Um, that'll come towards the end of the month. All right. So, so again, so Kotlin allows you to interact with reactive streams through the reactive framework, which is what you saw me doing. I was just reacting using the reactive streams framework. 
um, you know, in its face. Uh, I didn't use Kotlin to do that for me. There is a way, however, to gain the advantage of the reactive streams and at the same time not talk to the reactive org reactive streams framework uh, object scopes. Um, and this is through coroutines. So coroutines specifically give you the ability to push your uh, data through reactive streams in a um, very, what do you call that? So, all right, all right, I'll, I'll just tell you, I'm not using coroutines. So we're gonna gloss over this really quickly. But if you're ever interested, you would wanna do this because being able to write suspend functions, we can try this right now, we can try this live. Let's, let's do something. Let's, let's, um, let's say that I have a stream here and I guess auth summarizer uh, I guess I have a test for it as well, right? There must be a test. Yeah, I have auth summarizer tests. Okay. So you know that auth summarizer returns what? Um, it returns a flux, right? Yeah. So there's a fun, there's a function here. Fun starts is the starting of a function. Usually you have methods. Normally you say like private void or private, um, uh, private flux, you know, auth metadata. In this case, you have fun function name and then arguments followed by the colon and whatever it returns. So if you've used Pascal before, it's very similar to Pascal. Um, although I wouldn't mention that every day because Pascal is not something that we're gonna uh, talk about. Microservices and Pascal, that sounds cool. So the Java form of this function would look something like that, right? Ooh, why did I have an equals? I don't know why there's an equals in there. I'll tell you why there's an equals in there in a second. Um, one of the cool things about Kotlin is that it allows you to not have to write a body block. You can just return the element. But in any case, here's the Java form of this uh, really quickly. Um, let's make it abbreviate it. Let's abbreviate this. Anyway, so in Java, you would have to write an entire block of code. Um, you know, it looks a little bit different. It probably, it, you probably think, yeah, that's not so bad, right? I mean, it's not horrible. It's, it's pretty good, actually. It's, you know, doesn't make you think too much. And if you've seen Java, you're looking at Java code all day, so it looks like, you know, everyday stuff. Um, now, what we're doing here is what we want to do is kind of go and turn this into a, um, an inline function, okay? So we have override fun, which is our, our declaration um, of the compute aggregates method and it returns a flux. And if you notice I have equals and you're wondering like, okay, so you mean to tell me that you don't have to return the value using a block? You know, you don't have to do this, return elements? Uh, correct, as long as you don't have preceding code or any setup code, right? Uh, you don't need a block. If in this case, um, I'm talking directly to the reactive stream and I can just go ahead and use its operators and each operator returns something about that stream. Um, it's a fluent interface, so it's always returning this, right? And this is that stream that I'm working on. So elements.filter group by is one whole statement. And as long as it's one statement or something that returns uh, within a, con a, a concise block, um, you can just go ahead and write your functions uh, in this way. Uh, let's go up here just to make sure that we got that correctly. And uh, so function foo val in or no val um, in string and equal, hi, no dictation today. Oops, hello plus n. So you would be able to do this. Uh, and that's um, a simplified version of, you know, your block, your typical body block. Um, so that's what I'm doing here. Okay. Now, uh, back to coroutines. Uh, so coroutines, uh, let's try this. Take an instance of the following code. So they give me a code and they say, hey, this thing here is going to use a launch block. Uh, the code will launch in a long running operation without blocking the main thread. Uh, the prepare post is a function that's suspendable. So we already know that that's happening outside of the current thread. Um, and then the keyword suspend prefixes um, the, pre -post, the prepare post method. Uh, and that basically says, yeah, put this method on another thread when you run and let it or not actually allow it to um, exit the current cycle um, event loop and then allow it to return uh, to that particular uh, point in execution within the event loop. 
Um, so what we want to do is we want to be able to reason with our code as it, it can be suspended. Um, one, of, one of the important things about the JVM is that you, know, you have code re-entrance, which means that you know, if you're thinking about uh, when one statement executes and then the next statement executes, there might be time between two statements. You know? uh, for instance, uh, there might be time. You know, something can happen between these two statements, right? Um, so I think we can all reason that, yeah, that, that wouldn't be thread safe because it's non reinsurable code, and therefore you can have all sorts of, uh, if, if it's time sensitive, something might change, and you might be dealing with a new state, or you might be dealing with uh, an error, and you never got to execute the rest of that method, right? So that happens, um, and, and that's why we want to be able to say um, that, that's a side effect of being able to suspend a function and being able to resume a function, okay? All right, um, anyway, let's try that. Let's try overwrite suspend. Oh, I guess I have to uh, make that a suspend up here, huh? So if I did that, so it would say, yeah, okay. So let's go ahead and make that a suspense function. Okay, so it's suspended. Now I can probably go into my tests and say, yeah, now my auth summarizer tests are broken because it's like, hey, you know, what are you doing? You, you can't just do that. Uh, so I have to put this into a block of code. So I, I think it would look something like this. I think, not 100% sure yet. We're gonna test it. That's why we are in a unit test. So we're gonna do launch and we're going to say, go ahead and why is launch red? That's bugging me out, man. So launch block, would it, oh, that's right, I have to add a flag. Okay, I must have to add a flag to this. Huh, nice, great. Okay, just what I needed. Uh, I needed to add some extra complexity uh, to my code. So I don't wanna do that. I don't wanna add extra complexity to my code. Um, and this is great, I have that option. I'm not gonna exercise that option now. Um, I wanna get on to our normally scheduled programming of explaining why I did this whole entire thing using Kotlin and not using suspend up front. Um, okay, I'm gonna back out. All right, delete, 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 delete that. Just kidding, nothing's getting deleted, except for Rick Astley. He has to get deleted. Um, let's try going here and looking at uh, one of my favorite things. Uh, okay, all right. Nothing about this function looks terrible. Um, everything about this function looks very, very normal until you realize I am, um, hmm, yeah, but that's too, it's too normal. Um, oh, here we are, what is this? What are you doing here, Mario? Why, why do you have um, these extra things? Why do, you have why do you have comments in your code? I can't believe Kotlin lets you comment your code. Um, if there's anything, just please don't, don't like, you know, bug me because I have comments in my code. I know that, I'm going to delete them. Um, that's the best thing I did. The best thing you can do to refactor first is getting rid of comments. If you can read the code, don't use comments. That's what I heard. It was beaten to me with a, with a stick. Um, I, I wouldn't suggest that on your kids though. Don't, don't beat your kids because they comment their code. Um, that, that shames them, that, that makes them want to write PHP. And if the more kids write PHP, the, the thing is, is PHP can be like a, a way of, 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 of calming the nerves, but at the same time, it, something else goes wrong. It's, anyway, it's a talk with uh, your, you know, your local priest or something. I'm gonna code PHP. Um, okay, so what's happening here is we have a test case. This test case uses something called Mockbean. Uh, I think there was a talk uh, with Raphael about um, how like AOP or actually about um, Java agents and how Makito works and how Makito creates agents. Um, there is this really cool annotation in um, the Spring Boot, actually, in the Spring framework that allows you to say, hey, um, this bean is not going to be represented by any real like object. And so mock bean exists to be able to say, um, this will be a mocked object. Uh, in other words, uh, I should only be able to uh, use Makito to handle the state of this object. Uh, and that's what we're doing here. So not a Kotlin thing, a Spring thing, right? 
So, um, but what's this? Why is this laden at var thing even reasonably readable? Like, wasn't public, you know, wasn't public topic repository good enough? Um, no, because immutability. We, we want the idea that all of your data is right there in front of you. And when that doesn't happen, it's a special case. Uh, in this case, it is a special case. Um, I have a repository that may or may not um, be there when this program starts up. So in order to reach steady state, I have to tell the compiler, hey, this object doesn't exist until much later. And that's why we use late init. And late init allows us to say, OK, um, something like an IOC container, for instance, will come along, take that variable, populate it, and then I can start using it. And if you, when you do that, uh, you have to be sure that you don't access that variable before it gets initiated. In other words, it prioritizes initiation of that variable. And therefore, it's late, which is the way, I think there was, there used to be another way of doing that um, called lazy. So let me see if I can bring that up real quick. There's a few ways of doing that, but the most popular way, at least for me, is to use late init. Now, if you're using Kotlin, are you using late init or are you using lazy? Who is using lazy? One of you is using lazy and doesn't want to say, okay, fine. That's okay. All right, so nothing inherently bad about that. Um, it's a little uh, terse, um, but it's succinct. It, it actually tells me about the nature of the program given. Um, so moving on, uh, let's not go too far into the spring topic. Uh, let's stay on the Kotlin topic. Um, or, yeah, OK. So uh, one of those things that you probably wondered also is, where is your new keyword? Uh, Kotlin doesn't have a new keyword. You can't say new object like you do in Java. Uh, in Kotlin, instantiating an object just means you call its constructor directly. And that's it. So for instance, you have this pair here, right? And what is a pair? Did I make a pair? I know I didn't make a pair. I, I would never write something like this. Yeah, no, this is, this is a Kotlin JVM, uh, a basic a, uh, core uh, language uh, component called pair. And it just represents, you know, a, a uh, already two arguments um, object. So what I did was I just went ahead and used all of the Kotlin stuff. I said, hey, I'm going to use pair, and hey, I'm going to use this thing called map of. Uh, map of is another one of those Kotlin, uh, Kotlin collection utilities that, you know, like collections.map of singleton map in, in Java collections. It just wraps. That's all. So we're adding some syntactical sugar around that by, by giving it to the um, uh, top scope. So remember how I said, hey, yeah, you could just go ahead and write stuff without having a class? Um, that's what they're doing here. They're just saying, OK, well, we're going to put a package and its collections, and we're going to you know, public fun within this package. So Kotlin collections dot, um, dot map of is just a top level uh, function that you call from anywhere. So those are fun. And then there's inline functions. Uh, inline functions are described here, I believe. Ooh, hi. Here we are. OK. So inline functions are interesting. Uh, they're interesting because I haven't really used them. Um, I haven't found a use for it. That actually simplifies my code, at least. You might uh, find an interesting use for this. Um, in fact, the whole idea behind this is to, to pique your interest. Hey. Um, I'm going to write some code, and I don't want it to be so, you know, verbose. I want it to be very simple. So I guess, I guess what I'm saying is, yeah, let's let's make um, functions, and and let's like uh, be able to kind of do things that we can't do in Java. Let's let's add functions to objects that don't already exist, right? Uh, without having to overwrite the class, right? So in, in line functions, I'll read from here. It's just using high order functions uh, imposes the runtime penalties. Uh, each function is an object, and it captures a closure. A closure is a scope of variables that can be accessed in the body. Um, OK, um, beyond the architectural limitations, um, there is a case for this. 
uh, by using inline lambdas. So the function shown below here uh, is, a, is a lock function, and we're going to inline it. And uh, so there's lock. It's just, you know, it takes an argument and it does something else. Um, and then you can kind of wrap it. Now, to make this uh, compiler uh, generate, in order to make the compiler understand that this is inlined at the call site, that is, the code exists at the call site when it's compiled, uh, you can just use inline. And inline will actually, it's, I wouldn't say optimized, but don't like to use that word, uh, optimized. It's kind of a bad word in programming parlance these days, but uh, it is, uh, and it allows us to eliminate some of that overhead um, of calling functions uh, by, by keeping the block of code at the site and thus in, in line. Uh, so that's why I don't use it, because I don't actually have a reason to inline functions, um, unless you really have a, a tight inner loop that gets executed millions of times and you want that to be optimized. Uh, you're you're going to find very few cases to use inline then. But then there's no inline. So if you don't want all of your lambdas passed into an inline function, uh, some of them can be non-inlined, uh, which is a cool another cool thing too. Uh, so inline lambdas can not only be inlined, but um, you can pass inlineable arguments, uh, which is very cool because functions are first-class citizens, and those themselves can be inlined. Um, which is awesome. So if you don't want it to be inlined, then you can just go ahead and say, hey, I'm calling this function, but one of its arguments, you know, is I don't want this thing to be sitting on the stack, you know, at execution time. I, I want this thing to be executed somewhere else. So you can just say, hey, don't inline this. And that's what's happening here. So nothing, nothing too, you know, uh, objective about this other than like performance penalties uh, resulting from having inline code and non-inline code, or really performance penalties of having non-inline code. Um, so if it really means anything to you, you'll, you'll have like a specific use for inline and non-inline codes. Um, so that's performance, that's optimization. Nobody talks about optimization anymore. Nobody talks about Bruno either, but you know, I don't know. I don't know why anybody talks about that guy, Bruno. Not Bruno Borges, that's a cool guy. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's our Bruno. Yeah, say hi to Bruno. Definitely talk about that Bruno, he's a cool Bruno, okay. <laughs> so, alrighty. Um, so pretty much, there's a little, there's a few things to do here um, to clean up. And obviously, you know, you're probably thinking, well, that's all fine and dandy, but your code base is still bulging. It's it's still millions of, or hundreds of thousands or maybe even thousands of lines of code. Uh, did you actually do anything? Uh, and I say, yeah, I think, uh, I think that given the understanding of the, of the syntax, I do believe that this is easier to read at the end of the day. You don't have to really fuss with what's going on. Um, things like, you know, there, there's a couple of um, other things I, I would like to show, but uh, we might be running out of time or we might not be running out of time. Uh, we're looking good. Um, okay, let me do one more thing with you guys here. Um, just, just to pique your interest. So since I'm using the Spring Framework and Kotlin, I'm going to go ahead and, and show uh, named parameters. So, you know, in Java, when you call a, a function or a method, you normally just put the arguments, the arity, like, as they are, right? And you, you don't really have a chance to kind of see what's happening. So let's look at this. Uh, let's, so we have something called step verifier. It's an object. It's, it's there for testing. Um, and step verifier is a... Java object, so we're not going to be able to do it there. Let's just go ahead and, and uh, write a function. Let's go into REPL, and uh, let's show what that looks like, what named arguments look like, at least. So you have function foo and string. So if I want it to, I can, say, I, I can call foo, and I can say n equals uh, bar. And it'll say hello bar. Um, so this, that helps readability. Um, if an engineer gains something from that alone, it should be that, yes, I don't have to worry about drilling into that function and understanding what that function was going to do with that variable that I have no idea um, what it's named inside of the function. Uh, therefore, your code should be more readable uh, just off the bat, just by using named functions. In fact, 
we should probably talk about name functions as, as a way of refactoring our code, uh, because I'm not using name functions on purpose. Um, you know, I still have the, a lot of us, when we code from one language to the other, we typically take, we typically take our practices we, we know from before, and we carry it forward. Um, in this case, uh, I tend to just to carry it forward and refactor later. Um, so I would like to do that. I would like to go, oh, yes, you know, if you want to use Kotlin, use Kotlin. But to get any value out of it, you got to have more readable code. And there is one value proposition, and that's named arguments. Um, of course, that, that doesn't work with var args. Like when you have a, a var arg, you have something like, you know, fun, my var arg, fun, and colon, ooh, let's see if I use that right. Variable, I believe it's var arg. Um, yeah, let me just go ahead and look it up. Because why not? Um, so spread operator. You know, in Java, you have dot, dot, dot. Uh, and it basically says, hey, yeah, I have an unlimited number of arguments. So here, we just use the var arg keyword, OK? So fun, var arg, um, ooh, var garg. That's a new one. Uh, and string. So yeah, you'll just call it like this, equals var, right? It will return a string. Um, but you can also call it like my var arg fun. Uh, very long name, A, B, C, hi. Yes, we are good. We are amazing. Yes, thank you so much. OK, so yeah, var args and Kotlin work this way. Um, they don't necessarily lend to readability, but at the same time, you know, you have that option. If you're using Java, you would use dot, the ellipsis, dot, dot, dot. Uh, in, in Kotlin, just use var arg. Um, all right. So, now, if you're thinking, "Hey, is this? Are are you done? Are you are you like gonna are you gonna are you gonna bore us more with with uh, PHP code? Um, because this looks like PHP code, Mario. Um, no, I'm not. Actually, I just want to let you know. Look, if you feel like you want to start with PHP, don't. Just remember what I said. If if you do PHP, it's gonna it cause an overload at the psychiatrist down the street. Your your kids are gonna get mad, and um and and basically all of your your bits will go into the dev null, and we want to avoid that. Um, also, Godzilla will come out and spit PHP everywhere, uh, and we can't have that either. Um, so use Kotlin instead. It will help with readability. If there's one thing to take away, it's use the, um, use the name arguments. Use it as a way to make your code more readable. Uh, use it as a way to kind of gain more insight into like, the functional uh, methods of programming and, um, and having more fun in your, in your code, because uh, coding should be fun uh, and not, not PHP because they're both three-letter words, but one of them is obviously funner than the, the other. That was terrible. Okay, I'm here all day, guys. Thank you very much.